Hello and welcome to the podcast in the words of Visit. Today I'm joined by Professor Raven Connell. She has done a tremendous contribution in the world of uh, of feminism and in the uh, world of social constructs and talking about the masculinity. Her theories of like hegemonic masculinity, her books like Masculinity has done a tremendous contribution in the world of social scientists. Welcome to the show, Professor Ivan Connell. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here and have the chance to talk with you. Could you tell us more about yourself to our listeners? Um, well, I'm a social scientist. I've worked as a sociologist all, all my life. Uh, as you say, I've done research on questions about gender um about relations between men and women about masculinities and different kinds of masculinities i've also done research on education on social justice in schools uh i've done work on uh on the history of societies and i've done uh, also a good deal of work on questions of knowledge um of the different forms of knowledge in the world of the history of and global relationships in um, in forms of knowledge so i've i've worked across a fair range of of issues i guess but certainly one of the most important uh, of the the topics that i've worked on is uh, gender relations and uh, the different forms that uh, the gender takes in people's lives Okay, great uh, great to hear your interaction and as we celebrate as i told you we were going to our theme of this podcast is going to be the women's day uh, celebrations as we talk about yes. as the world is going to celebrate the women's day on this monday so how important what is the importance of this women's day and how far have we come uh, in giving rights to women in past say, 100 years and how, how much more contributions needs to be done as we have seen in like first world countries there are women are getting rights but in third world countries they're still uh, far far behind in getting rights and how much work mm. needs to be done yeah well it is an interesting story i mean um women's day um was originally uh, as um uh, was founded i guess about 100 years ago a bit over 100 years 110 120 years ago it was largely founded by the labor movement by working people's movements um i think the very first uh women's day celebration was in in 1911 uh by the um so just just a, a little more than 100 years ago um since uh a few years after that <laughs> it has been celebrated on the 8th of march and it was originally especially for working women uh not for middle class or or ruling class women but for women working in factories in shops um in um in agriculture uh on farms and so forth that was the women that that the day was designed for and that's really important to remember i think um it was adopted by the united nations uh back in 1975 when the united nations uh decided to hold an international women's year um and which became then the first year of a, a decade the united nations decade for women <coughs> and that was the point i think at which the women's day celebrations became genuinely international and a kind of worldwide um recognition that uh, the position of women was not what it should be and uh and therefore there needed to be public acknowledgement uh, of women's role in the world um and it's still needed i think because um actually there's no country in the world that has complete gender equality nowhere not rich countries not poor countries not in the global north not in the global south not in the east not in the west no country um has full gender equality so there is work to be done uh for the advancement of women 
in every part of the world. In Australia, for instance, in my country, this is a rich country, though it has many poor people in it, but on average, it's, it's relatively rich. But we are currently having a rape scandal, a scandal about the rape of a woman in the National Parliament building. Um, we every year have a debate about uh, why women's wages are less than men's. Um, we constantly having discussions of why there are so few women in positions of public authority, in government, at the top levels of the, of the economy. Um, so this is a global issue, a genuinely global issue. Um, and um, no one has a single solution to it either. Um, you know, there have been huge debates uh, all over the world in women's movements, in feminist movements, particularly going on, uh, you, you know, uh, we do know something about, about what has to be done. Yeah, indeed, uh, we need to do a lot of work in that. And why is that there are, still in women in our country, there are people are anti-feminism. They say that feminism, I don't know why they, there are people such as that. I, I believe there will be in people in Australia as well. So why do people fear feminism when they are just asking for equal rights? Well, most of the people who fear feminism are men, and it is men on the whole who are advantaged uh, by gender inequality. So if uh, women's wages are lower, that means that men's wages are higher. And there is what I call a patriarchal dividend uh, available to men in a society which maintains inequality between men and women. Um, men, you know, not all men, uh, but significant numbers of men actually do benefit economically in terms of better jobs, higher incomes, uh, more ownership of land, uh, more power in organisations. Those are the benefits that many men fear would be lost if women had equal rights. Now, there's something uh, that's not a ridiculous thing to say. Uh, if women are genuinely equal to men, then men's advantages are lost, but they will collectively gain in other ways. And that may mean a greater prosperity for all uh, rather than a, a, a gender competition for resources. But there are other things that also have to change, and it's not just the economy, although that's very important. But we also have to think about, um, about violence uh, and about culture. Um, we do have to contest the forms of violence that women are particularly subject to, such as rape as I mentioned, sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, um, which you know, occurs in, in all countries, um, sexual harassment where women, for instance, in the street or in shops are liable to be harassed by men. Um, those, those kinds of things have to be contested too. And um, there are issues about, I mean, one of the, the big changes that has occurred, I think we can be proud of this, there's been enormous improvement in women's education over the last two generations. So in my grandmother's generation, it was not common for women to go to university. Universities were mostly for men. Well, now if you look around the world, half of the students in universities worldwide are women. We have achieved equality there. And although it is still true, uh, especially in poor countries, um, that uh, more women are illiterate um, than men. Nevertheless, the rate of literacy, the number of women who do have the skill to read and write, and thus participate in, uh, 
in, in written culture, that number has increased enormously over the last two generations. So we can be proud of what we've done in terms of literacy, education for girls. There's been great advances there. And that really, I think, is one of the biggest revolutions in, in modern history, in fact. Uh, and, and we can be proud of it. But it's not complete. It's not complete until we do have genuinely equal uh, access to culture, to literacy, until women's voices are regarded as having equal authority to the voices of men, then we still have, have places to go. Yeah, hopefully we can see that happening in our lifetimes. And as, as you talked, mentioned that uh, in, in uh, two generations back, women's education wasn't common. So uh, one question comes to our mind, what, was, what is the reason that historical perspective that man, women has always been suppressed and man has always continued to remain in power? Where it began and yeah. what is the historical perspective on that? Well, there's, there, there is debate um, about why, why that happened. Um, and uh, I, I have a view of that, which is, uh, I'm not certain is historically correct. Um, but I do, um, in, in thinking about that issue of why patriarchal inequalities uh, arose, I take very seriously the fact of differences among men, which we can also talk about um, in, in a few moments. Men in general have power, but not all men have power. There, there are a lot of men who have very limited social power. And I think that is part of the story that uh, the subordination of women as a, um, you know, as, as a common social fact has always gone along with the subordination of some groups of men to others. So there are social hierarchies among men as well as between men and women and between powerful men and less powerful women. So the history of, of gender inequality, I think, is bound up with the creation about, I suppose about 8,000 years ago uh, of uh, governments of states, of kings and monarchies, of temples, um, of patterns of, uh, of social hierarchy, which became part of the culture, part of the, the institutions um, that, that human societies uh, were structured by. And that continues to the day. To, 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 to today, even though the, the institutions themselves have changed. So we don't have many temples around now, but we have lots and lots of corporations. And you look at the corporation, you know, Microsoft or Facebook or um, Standard Oil or whatever, um, you're basically looking at a patriarchal system run almost always by men at the top with lots of other men lower down and lots of women lower down. That's an old, old pattern that has persisted, been reproduced socially through time. And one of the ways it's been reproduced is through forms of culture that tell people men and women are naturally unequal, that men are stronger or smarter, more intelligent and so forth. Um, so, you know, legends, myths, um, uh, you know, media, mass media stories and so on and so forth are constantly giving us sexist pictures of which, which treat uh, men as more important, more central, more authoritative and women as decorative and silly and comical and in various ways ridiculous. Um, so the culture itself has, <clears throat> once gender inequalities got, got 
established through social institutions, it has been relatively easy to reproduce that, that inequality over time. And that means we do have to, in order to gain equality for women, we do have to struggle against sexist ideas, uh, against hostile stereotypes of women, of the kind of jokes that put women down, mother-in-law jokes, jokes against brides, and so forth. Um, and, and there's a lot of that in the world still. You know, even when people know better, um, that is still fairly constantly uh, being reproduced in mass media by politicians who should know better and so forth. So it's a, it's a historical story. Um, there is actually <clears throat> um, scientific evidence about the question of whether men are smarter than women. The scientific evidence became available more than 100 years ago. And the answer is men and women have equal levels of intelligence. In fact, men and women are very similar in their psychological makeup. And there's a vast amount of evidence that shows that. And what's quite interesting is how, how many people disbelieve that, uh, that evidence, uh, because the common sense is, you know, women have one kind of psychology, men have a different kind of psychology. But in fact, we're very similar in our mental makeup. What's different is our social situations. And of course, our reproductive biology, the role that we, we play in the production of the next generation in, in biological reproduction. That's a difference, but that's not uh, a difference that produces a different kind of, of psychology. And therefore, if we look back at history, we find that the levels of gender inequality, of inequality between men and women, are different at different periods, in different institutions, in different cultures, at different you know, historical moments in, in uh, any culture. So we know that gender inequality has changed. They sometimes get worse. It's not always changing for the better. They sometimes can get worse, for instance, under, under military dictatorships, gender inequality usually gets worse. Um, but if it can change, we can make it change in positive directions. And that's a really important lesson, I think, that, that we can learn. Indeed, uh, you, as you talked about the cultural context we, and mass media, we see, even see in the movies today that they, this is being, still is being there promoted that women are different than men and they have different emotions, they behave differently, men, mm. men behave differently. And as you talked yeah. about military dictatorship, there's a point in our, our country, there was a, there have been multiple coups, but in the 1980s, uh, there was a dictatorship and after that, women's rights were suppressed. And more than that, that uh, religious thing, religion wasn't that much part of that, but the culture got connected with the religion. Now people think that religion is suppressing the rights, but it's actually a cultural thing. So I don't, uh, yes. I think we need a lot of work to do to change that culture. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the same was true in other parts of the world with military dictatorships. For instance, in the 70s, 70s and 80s, there were a number of military dictatorships in, in uh, Latin America, in South America, and women's rights went backwards under them. Why? Um, well, one obvious reason is that the armies are patriarchal institutions. They're controlled by men and usually very conservative men. Um, so it's not surprising that that happens at such times. Yeah. So as we talked about the women uh, being a transsexual women, what do you think that they contribute? How much have we come to uh, giving more rights to transgenders and they getting less abuse and how much more work we need to do still? Well, there is a good deal of work to do then. I think it is true that there is more, uh, now more recognition of the human rights of trans women 
and other feminized groups uh, like travesti in, in South America. Um, that, uh, that has been a long struggle, um, but there is currently significantly more recognition in, um, for instance, in international organizations uh, like the United Nations, uh, that that is a human rights issue. Um, and uh, there have been changes in the law in a number of countries. Um, I'm not sure of my figures here, but I think something like 20 or 30 uh, different countries have in fact uh, improved the legal situation of trans groups within the last 20 years. Uh, so there is progress being made there. Um, and importantly, that has happened in South Asia, uh, which of course has long-standing groups, uh, which, which could, can be regarded as trans groups, some of whom are, um, think of themselves as trans women. Um, so this is a place, uh, a, a region of the world where there is cultural recognition there is a certain familiarity with that situation. And uh, although there's also hostility and suspicion, there's also a significant degree of recognition. And that's very pleasing, um, it's good. Um, there are other parts of the world where the, uh, the reverse has happened, uh, especially where new authoritarian regimes have come in in places like Hungary in Europe, um, which have, uh, have uh, actually decided to attack uh, trans groups and so have made the legal situation worse. So there is a struggle going on around these issues um, in which conservative religious groups are sometimes um, quite hostile to trans rights, but there are other religious groups uh, which are positive uh, about it. So, you know, it's a complicated situation. I think we, we have made progress within the last generation and that, that is certainly a relief and, and pleasing to see. Yeah, hopefully we make more progress in that field, giving more rights to women, transgender, and as we see in the BLM movement, giving more rights to Blacks. And as we move uh, toward the more progressive change, our, our, is our left more growing to suppress the conservatives and giving rights to these people? And uh, there's also been a huge talk uh, about in post 1980s, there's a growing inequality in terms of wealth and uh, in wealth. And people are going to talk about uh, giving more wealth distribution, giving money to more poor people. Are we uh, moving to a more progressive world? Uh, unfortunately, I think at the moment the answer has to be no. Uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, you're quite right, in most countries in the world, uh, the level of, of economic inequality um, has increased. So the very rich groups, the very rich people have got richer. Um, the billionaires, as the Americans call them, um, have increased their wealth phenomenally. Even very recently during the, the COVID e epidemic, the billionaires increased their wealth at the same time as the poorer half of, of the population lost income because of unemployment and, and economic disruption. So yeah, this is one of the biggest issues in the world, I think. The, the rising level of, of concentration of wealth in a few hands and the increasing economic precarious situation of very large numbers of poor people. Um, now, how we deal with that, um, it's not something that, that we can just wish away. We, we can't deal with that. Um, simply by changing the culture, by changing our minds. It does need actual organising. It needs economic organisation, it needs unions, uh, it needs political parties representing the interests of poor people. Um, 
And of course, it intersects with what we were saying about, um, about gender, because the majority of the poorest people in the world are women. Uh, the majority of very poor families are families headed by women with, with only one earner, uh, where the earner is a woman who suffers from inequality of wages. And the majority of billionaires, of course, are men. Uh, so the top levels of the corporate world of the big um, rich capitalist corporations, the top levels there are basically made up of men. Um, so there is a connection then between gender inequalities and the, uh, the pattern of, of, of economic inequality, which makes it, you know, uh, makes us realize that, that we have to, there's no simple solution uh, to inequality. We have to work on, on different fronts. There need to be multiple campaigns uh, around these issues. Um, lots and lots of people are needed to be active um, and we can't sit back and just assume it will all happen automatically. It's, it's um, social struggles are, 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 are absolutely necessary for social change. There's hopefully, no way around that. Yeah, hopefully we see a more progressive world and raise awareness. Uh, raising awareness is an important part and making people realize that how cultures and how they are affecting us and what work we need to do for the uh, well-being of others and ours. It was absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for your time. And if you ever come to Paya, you're invited actually to come to Pakistan and give talks and it will be an absolute honor to have you. Thank you. I would love to come. Um, at the moment, because of the epidemic, I'm not traveling anywhere, but I will, I will, um, I appreciate your invitation and hope sometime that I can take it up. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care.